Welcome back to my review of every Pokemon anime series. In this video, we're going over the 6th anime series, Pokemon Sun and Moon. This is probably the most controversial series next to Black and White, and it's because of the huge shift in tone and art style. Because of this, many people hated or still hate the Sun and Moon anime. But is it really warranted? Does the change in direction really make this the worst Pokemon series? Or is it actually a great series? Well, after watching every single episode, it's time to truly find out. So joining me today are Trayman1, TSS, and Entity Maze. Uh, Lola everyone, Trayman1 here! Hi folks, this is TSS Killer from PocketMonsters.net and the Pokepod. Yo, what's going on guys? It's your boy Entity here. Just like the last couple of reviews, we'll be going over a list of topics from the series, going over both the good and the bad, and then wrapping things up with the final verdict. So with that being said, let's get started with our retrospective review of the Pokemon Sun and Moon anime. Let's go! As always, we gotta start out with our main man, Ash. Now at first glance, it might seem like Ash has lost his experience from XY, but this is a huge misconception. Although Alola didn't have as many battles as Kalos, Ash is still the experienced trainer from the previous series. The big difference, however, is the setting. Since Ash isn't really traveling in the series, he isn't in such a hurry for the next big battle. This has allowed him to take things easy, get to know the new environment, and fall in love with Alola's culture. This is one of my favorite things about this series. By the very end, Ash has made such strong friendships with his classmates, was part of Kakui and Burnett's family, and considered Alola as his second home. It's very wholesome. With him being so ingrained into the lifestyle and culture of Alola, it only makes sense that this is the region where he finally wins a Pokemon League. Well, that and the fan outrage after losing the Kalos League. Oh, boss, I go come back to me. What the heck? What are you doing here? You already had your video. Anyways, going back to Ash and his experience, although he does have his usual epic battle moments, I do understand why some might think that this is a reset once again. I mean, look at him. The new art style along with the comedic tone of the series really makes this feel like a different version of Ash. This is without a doubt the most controversial aspect of the series, so this definitely needs to be addressed right away. And TSS just so happens to be the right guy for the job. It would be my pleasure, Zach. Sun and Moon was the first series since Advanced Generation to go back to a traditional 24 frames per second. Gone were the buttery smooth panning shots and fluid CG animated effects that variable frame rate would offer. While this series excelled in the battle animation department, corners were cut in a way where the rest of the presentation suffered. For one, Satoshi's design, especially at the beginning of the series, was a massive departure from his previous designs. It looked like somebody put his face in a toaster oven for 20 minutes. It was very jarring to look at. What also was jarring was the quality of the background scenes and characters, which in and of itself brings a slew of questions. Why do Satoshi and Pikachu have no faces? Why does Kiawe's neck look elastic? Why does Satoshi look like a stick figure? Why does Meowth look like he was drawn by a five-year-old? How? What? Why? And it doesn't stop there. Another major change was the decision to make this a comedy-oriented series. I'm a firm believer that this was a knee-jerk reaction to Yokai Watch, a series that was designed to be a comedy from the ground up. Don't believe me? Watch how both of them handle comedic delivery. Even Pose had a dance sequence that was in similar vein to Yokai Exercise Number 1. However, Sun and Moon ultimately failed in the comedy department because their style was too forced. Most of those sequences were initiated by Satoshi, who looked like he was on certain substances. Cocainum. The rest of the cast tried to get quick laughs by overreacting to situations, which in all honesty, weren't funny. They were off-putting and out of place. Thankfully, by the beginning of the third year, they realized this wasn't working and reduced the reactions that we'd see on screen. Not before I had to witness Maltachu in person. Before I lose any more brain cells, we're next gonna talk about Satoshi's Pokemon. Jesus. Let's go! What exactly makes Roller a god in the eyes of our community? Well, despite being a small, unevolved bird, Rodin surprisingly took many wins to his name, some of which included fully evolved Pokemon, which was always a spectacle to watch. However, it's not like these wins weren't warranted though, as Rodin had quite a few good training segments and entire episodes dedicated to gaining development. To top off this bird, he also has such a cute personality that we all can't help but aww at. The sleeping is relatable too. The only downside to Rowler is they pretty much did nothing within Season 2 except learn a new move abruptly. But let's be real, he was just storing his power to absolutely obliterate everybody within sight in Season 3. Especially the Situai. Who's mad? Now it's time to talk about Oxerock Doggo Lycanroc. 
This capture was one of the most surprising as we all thought Rockruff belonged to Professor Kakui. Its berserk mode was handled pretty interestingly as many thought it was overreacting from getting dirty. However, Lycanroc was actually being prideful because of its one of a kind form. Thankfully, while training with Tabu Bulu, Ash helped him realize that even though its appearance changed, it's still the same lovable rock rough from before. This Pokemon is definitely one of Ash's powerhouses, being able to defeat Olivia's Lycanroc as a rock rough, three of Nanu's Pokemon by itself, mind you, and most importantly, being the Pokemon that won Ash the Alola League. Proceed and Lycanroc is probably one of my favorite captures ever. Incineroar. Why? Well, the build up to Ash capturing this Pokemon was just so wholesome after the heartbreaking loss of its mentor, Stoutland. Litten looking to get stronger with a new master. And it most certainly did. It had astounding battles and astonishing episodes dedicated to training. Especially episode 63 where it gained Kukui's Incineroar as a rival and evolved into Torakat. Such a magnificent episode. And it all paid off nicely when Toraka managed to finally get the upper hand on Incineroar within the league, refusing to evolve further until that happened in fact. What a chad! So because of all of this staggering build up, Incineroar was an extremely fulfilling Pokemon. Just wish we got to see it in a grand trial to be honest. Next up is Ash's first legendary like Pokemon, Naganadale. Yes, Ultra Beast count as legendaries. Poipoo was great as this story involved in learning about the world and what it means to be a family through living with Ash. It would often express how much it loved his Alola family with his painting skills. These talents then came in handy when explaining that it was sent here on a mission to help save its dying world. Its return as a Naganadale, while it felt kinda random, was also extremely cool as it showed the results of the Necrozma arc made it stronger to protect this world from future threats, along with it now knowing Thunderbolt, a move that was inspired by Pikachu. Following Ash's first legendary Pokemon is Ash's first mythical Pokemon, Melmetal. Despite being caught quite late into the series, Melmetal had decent feats and battles. Nor was he ever plot armored to make Ash stronger like people suspected at first, as he did end up struggling, especially as a mountain, and got defeated quite a few times. At the end of the day, he's just an honorable battler. But I'm pretty sure we can all agree that what makes Melmetal stick with us is his joyful and reckless personality. It was hella cute. And speaking of cute, so was his bond with Ash's Rowlet who was a sort of mentor for it. Which makes sense cause, you know, he's God. Last but certainly not least, we have the sparking ace, Pikachu. While at first many people were upset with this change, Electro Web showed to be much more versatile than Electro Ball as it can be used as an attack, a shield, and so much more. The first grand trial showed that Pikachu was not reset as he excelled with many amazing new strategies. Pikachu also had a huge winning streak in this series, with his first loss being in episode 100 to a freaking Zero Aura, my gosh. It's only other loss after this fight are against Hapu's Golurk and tying with Gladion Zoroark after defeating the legendary Savali, of course. Pikachu's development also shined due to it having two rivals in the series being none other than Mimikyu and Tapu Koko. Throughout the series, we get many battles between Ash and Tapu Koko, with each battle having some indication that Ash's Z-move is powering up and foreshadowing the Pikachu and Z. Pikachu's final fight with Tapu Koko wraps up his development throughout the series extremely well, as he and Ash can finally utilize the power that Tapu Koko has been trying to bring out in an epic clash, and come out victorious in the end. Also, can I mention my boy Pikachu finally got him a little girlfriend in the series too, my boy was smooth with the ladies. Now that we're done with Ash and his Pokemon, let's move on to all the other wonderful characters this series had to offer. Starting with the best in my opinion, Suffi- No, it's Lily. From the very beginning, I became alert to Lily's character quite quickly for two simple reasons. Firstly, her innocent, clumsy, kind-hearted and adorable personality was always such a joy to watch, but skittering on into later seasons as well. And secondly, of course, I was fascinated by the mystery surrounding her of why she cannot touch Pokemon. This was something completely different from her character in the games, and already made her stand out significantly from the other companions due to how unique and intriguing this concept was. In fact, I speculated quite a bit of what could have happened in Lily's past along with many other fans. It was fun, and the build up of watching Lily slowly start to conquer her fear by touching her new Pokemon in various episodes was remarkable and heartwarming stuff, especially when she received Vulpix. But, my god, when this mystery was finally revealed, that being that she was almost abducted by an alien Pokemon at a very young age, was just by far one of the most dark, 
shocking yet exciting scenes we've ever witnessed from the Pokemon anime and I couldn't help but feel incredibly sorry for her. She sustained PTSD because of this such terrifying experience. Just the raw emotion from that flashback shows how traumatic this was for her. And then afterwards to see Lily overcome this trauma by regaining the strength to touch every single Pokemon once again was such a fulfilling conclusion to that development arc. Especially the scenes we received in which Lily jumps in for a hug with multiple Pokemon with a fast, bright smile on her face. Like, come on man, that was the happiest we've ever seen her. It was incredibly wholesome. I felt so happy to see this skill finally gain the ability to do something she mourned for for such a long time. What an emotional roller coaster. After this breathtaking development, however, Lily kinda took a backseat for a while, which I do feel like kinda hurt the rest of what she had to offer. As within episode 80, it was pretty much set up that Lily would soon reveal what she wants to do for a trainer goal, as she was on show at the moment. But because the series had to focus on so many other characters as well, no conclusion came from it. We have that set up, her receiving a Z Crystal and Z Ring to then mastering the Z move and surprisingly placing top 16 in the Alula League, but no goal. Instead, the writers decided to focus on family issues once again by making a search for her father, Moan. Which, don't get me wrong, I'm definitely intrigued to see where he is much like how I was invested in Lily's original mystery, but I do wish we got a proper conclusion as well. Hopefully, Journeys delivers on that, as it does seem like they will be wrapping up the Moan arc with that as well. But nevertheless, I still do believe the development we got to see after the Nebby arc was still spectacular anyway. Lily's proof thanks to researching, watching Ash's matches and placing in the top 16 that she can be a great battler. And not only that, but her whole character has also taught us that we can find courage inside of us as well, even if we need to search to find it. Which is such an admirable lesson, especially with the themes of the Sun Moon series. Next up, we have Kiawe, one of my favorite characters introduced in this series. He was introduced as the strongest trainer in the Pokemon school, and was the only one to use Z-moves at the time, so naturally, he became a rival to Ash. This was interesting because this was really the first time a companion was also a rival, but it worked pretty well. Although Kiawe wasn't as major of a rival like Gladion, his competitiveness with Ash always kept him on his toes. As the strongest in the school, they would constantly battle and train with each other which only sharpened their skills. So although Sun and Moon didn't have a lot of major battles like other series, this did show that they were constantly progressing and getting stronger. Kiawe's also got an awesome personality. He can be strict and serious when he needs to be, especially when it comes to the traditions of Alola, but also a great comic relief character as well. Although the comedy and funny faces go a bit overboard in this series, Kiawe is honestly the only character that truly makes it work in my opinion. He has some of the most over the top faces and reactions and it's hilarious. He's just a really passionate person which is why he can go from being serious in one moment to bursting out with emotion in the next. Now although Kiawe is my favorite Sun and Moon companion, or classmate if you want to be technical, that doesn't mean he's without his flaws. For the most part, aside from being Ash's training buddy, he doesn't really do much else to be honest. At the end of the series, it's revealed that he wants to be a kahuna like his grandfather, and that's honestly a perfect goal for him. But why couldn't this be a thing in the beginning? For the entirety of the series, Kiawe's goal was pretty generic, he just wants to be a strong trainer with nothing to work towards that'll show that. What makes it even worse is the fact that although he's supposed to be Ash's rival, we don't ever get to see a full serious battle between the two. The league would have been the perfect place to do so, but they didn't. And when they do have one after the league, it's skipped to the ending where he's decimated by Ash. Because of that, it makes it feel like Kiawe's only purpose in the series is to make Ash stronger, kinda like Farfetch'd to Riolu in Pokemon Journeys. But even if that's the case, Kiawe's still a great addition to the series in my book. Next on the docket is Sweden, or Lana, or whatever you want to call her. She has a fondness to water Pokemon and is portrayed as being quiet and kind. Her goal is to explore the sea from the inside of a giant water balloon. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite moments early in the series was in SM5 when she brought Satoshi home with her. Her little sisters, Ho and Sui, take a look at Satoshi and ask, Onechan no boyfriend though? Is that your boyfriend? And her reaction was priceless. However, as the saying, there are two sides of the coin goes, Sudan can become quite manipulative, deceiving, and downright aggressive. One example is in SM33 when she and Satoshi went to a lake to go fishing. Sweden outright states that she's going to fish a wild Mega Gyarados. 
Satoshi malfunctions like he had a buffer overflow, and then Sweden interjects with her catchphrase, Usa this, that's a lie. Satoshi then disintegrates into a pile of, well... Cocaine. She would often exaggerate her stories just to get a reaction from her fellow classmates. This other side of her personality would bleed into the polka problem in next episode previews as well. Unfortunately, aside from development of Poplio, which we'll talk about later, the backstory of her friendship with Mao and Sandy, her Eevee, Suiden's storyline was mostly thrown under the bus. I feel that she had the potential to be a Star Wars or Pokemon trainer, especially when she was given a good friendship with Kasumi, but it never came to fruition. By the way, while I'm here, I'd like to talk about that Eevee. Nagisa, or Sandy, first appeared in a post-episode segment called Eevee Doko Ikuno, or Where Are You Going Eevee? from SM93 to SM98 as a wild Eevee with long bangs. It had a great backstory. Fast forward to SM99, where we have the penultimate meeting with Suiren. Poplio then teams up with Eevee, resulting in this cool-looking sequence where Poplio learns surf and even gets assistance from a mantine that appeared in the mini-arc to make quick work out of the skulls by jumping off and using Double Edge. This inspires Suiren to catch it after finding out that it loves the sea. Then it gets a haircut and is completely shafted into a background character, making sporadic appearances until being used again in the first round of the Alola League. What the f***? Let's put this into perspective. The Pokemon Company does a year-long campaign to promote Eevee leading up to the game that's predominantly featured in, Let's Go Eevee. Then we have this great mini-arc in the anime around the time the game is going to be released. Then they toss all this in the garbage. What were they smoking? This is a complete disrespect to a secondary mascot character. Haruka and Serena actually did something with their Eevees, and the one series that's supposed to be about family and having in-depth storytelling completely falls flat. <sighs> if you want to see Eevee treated with respect during this era, check out Project Eevee. That's the true floofmeister. I'm gonna toast some marshmallows now. Haha, <laughs> good one bro. Time to discuss one of my personal favorites from the series, Mallow. While Milo didn't have the best development, her kind, warm, and motherly personality really brought the group together. Her goal always involved being the best cook in Lalola, and many of her episodes show her talents. Heck, she even cooked for Tabu Coco! She was always the most responsible of the group, which was a nice foreshadow that her mom wasn't around considering that she had to take on many responsibilities at an early age. The biggest acknowledgement of this is in the Oranger episode, where she runs away because her father is overworking her and we get to see her release all the stress and anger after having a few shots too many with Oranguru. <laughs> when we come to learn that her mother has actually passed away, we get to see a different side of Mallow. One with so much built up pain and regret considering the last thing that she said to her mother before she passed was, I hate you. My gosh, Pokemon. Her strong connection with Serena goes way back as this Pokemon was caught by her mother and is even known as her little sister. Shaman was also a nice symbolism of the gratitude that Mallow and her mother shared for each other. Even paying a nice homage by having the same eyes as Mallow's mother once becoming Skyform. Although it didn't really do much. Mallow's goal goes through a really interesting change towards the end of the series as she opens up her cafeteria to serve both people and Pokemon along with earning herself a Z-Ring. Her relationship with her best friend Lana was also extremely wholesome with Lana encouraging Mallow to never give up and fight to the end during their Lola League match. Overall, she was just such a wholesome character all around and definitely deserved more love and recognition in the series. Ending off the roster of characters is Sophocles and Rotom decks. <sighs> okay, let's start with Sophocles. Unfortunately, compared to his friends, there just isn't much going for him whatsoever. He's just sort of there for the first two seasons, tempering with gadgets and occasionally jumping in with some sort of snarky comment. And even when he did have episode focuses, none of them were dedicated to his goal whatsoever. In fact, his goal wasn't even revealed until episode 67, almost halfway through the entire series. And to make matters worse, the writers decided to make his goal to become an astronaut. Yeah, it's cool and all, I love space, but like, how do you show development towards that on screen? Yes, we did get that episode where he overcame his fear of the dog, which does help towards that as, you know, space is dark, but that's literally all we got. He should have really received a goal in my opinion, which we could watch on screen. It would have made him a far more interesting character. But even so, that isn't to say Sophocles didn't receive development in other areas as well. For example, in Season 3, he earned a Z-Ring, Z-Crystal, and mastered using it to become better at battles. Whilst finally, his rude personality, which many people had a problem with, mellowed over time. 
which all of this was honestly nice to watch at the time. Keyword, at the time. Because I still do believe it's not enough to make him memorable. I don't think I've met a single person who says Sophocles is their favourite Alola friend. At best, he's just adequate. Let's talk about Rotom Dex now, the character in the community known for being quote, annoying and boring. Yeah, I can definitely understand why people say this. Thanks to this character also making snarky remarks, only really being there to register Pokemon because the game has introduced this new mechanic, and he did have a hit or miss detective gag. However, much like Sophocles, I do believe he mellowed over time, mostly after the episode where him and Ash fought. But I wouldn't say I dislike him like I used to back in the day. He's alright, and I've come to laugh at some of his moments. However, whether you like or dislike him though, I think we can all agree he definitely got robbed of being a character in Journeys, despite the excellent build up in episode 98, where he stated he wants to travel the world with Ash after growing a stronger bond with him. And that makes me sad. <laughs> Not me. Shut up. Okay, now that we're done with our main protagonist of the series, it's time for our main antagonist, Team Rocket. This might come as a shock, but I actually really love them in this series. Now of course they still have their annoying moments, but to be fair, they appear way less often than in XY. On top of that, Sun and Moon Team Rocket gets so much development. In this series, Team Rocket do things like finally establish a secret base, inadvertently send an Alolan and Meowth to their headquarters, and their biggest accomplishment of all, Master Z moves. The progression they made towards this was handled really well, from them finding out about Z-moves, to getting a Z-crystal of their own, to getting a Z-ring from Nanu, and finally being able to use Z-moves. This was all timed perfectly too, because Nanu actually makes Team Rocket be the trial Ash has to overcome before facing him. This helped make Team Rocket surprisingly relevant and vital to the story. I also love the fact that when they use Z-moves, they all perform the poses together. That really wasn't necessary, but they do it because they're united. They've all worked together to reach this goal, so it only makes sense that they perform the Z-move as a team. Aside from progression though, what I really like about the trio is that like Ash, they fall in love with the region of Alola and made it a second home as well. And honestly, I think it was all thanks to Beware. What started out as them being held hostage turned into the trio's hearts melting thanks to the kindness of this strange, creepy, lovable, and abnormally overpowered bear. Probably the weirdest case of Stockholm Syndrome I've ever seen. This same kind of love and kindness was even extended to their Pokemon, as these are some of the Pokemon they formed the strongest bonds with. Another thing that should be mentioned is how Team Rocket actually benefited from Sun and Moon's comedic tone. While Team Rocket went full bad in black and white, in Sun and Moon, they go full comedic for the most part. And I think it works really well for them, since they've always been comedic to some extent. The downside to them though is that I wish Team Rocket's progression led to a bit more, you know? It seemed like Team Rocket were building up to a big arc similar to black and white, especially with the introduction of the Matori Matrix and the Necrozma arc. Unfortunately, it seems like the climax for them truly was the Pikachu vs Mimikyu trial. It's a shame too, as the Ultra Games introduced Rainbow Rocket, so it would have been so cool to have that in the anime. Now let's talk about the other evil team of the series Team Skull. For the majority of the series, we encountered three members of Team Skull known as Toop, Rap, and Zip. And let's be honest, they were basically the Alola's Team Rocket trio. Majority of their encounters were quick matches where they ended up receiving a Thunderbolt or a Z move by Pikachu. Things began to get interesting, however, after the announcement of the Alola League and the introduction of destruction in human form, it's your boy Guzma! Guzma's story was very unique from all the other team bosses, as his goal wasn't to take over the world or the region. Guzma was a tragic villain who could never defeat his longtime friend Kakui, or live up to the expectations of the Island Trial Challenge. His whole goal was to destroy Kakui's dream and to prove himself as the strongest in the region without the help of Z-moves. His raw strength shows throughout the entirety of the Alola League, defeating a pseudo-legendary Como, Illuma's Mega Kangaskhan as revenge for taking out the entirety of Team Skull, and Lana's Primarina in the most brutal way, making her Z-move and all her attacks useless in battle. Plumeria notices how Guzma's obsession to destroy Kakui's dream is bringing him out of his character as he becomes more and more aggressive in battle with his Pokemon. The aggression comes in full force in the battle against Ash as he sees the same look, battle style, and determination that he once saw in Kakui through Ash. This final battle between these two was awesome as it had many stakes for both characters who always seem to fail off short when it comes to winning major final battles. Guzma entered this battle with full confidence of winning, but as it goes on, we see many changes in his emotions, literally snapping at his partner Pokemon Gillespot for doing the same thing that his character is known for, running away. 
It's not until he witnesses that Glyph's pods will to win by taking a gigaball havoc that he realizes that he's been going about this battle all wrong and begins to go all out in the battle with Ash. This was such a beautiful conclusion to his story as we feel each character's drive to win and the song Notebook of Heart, which isn't a battle type of song, actually worked extremely well when setting the tone. What really got me was seeing Guzman actually crying after the battle, showing just how powerful of an effect it had on him. Surprisingly, Team Skull does not disband by the end of this either. Instead, they begin to look forward and do things in a different way in terms of being trainers. A great conclusion to their story. The final group of characters we like to discuss are the Rivals. Although not as large as other series, Sun and Moon still had some pretty notable ones. Before we get into Ash's Rivals though, surprisingly, Sophocles had one of his own. I'm serious. Horatio. There's not really much to say about this guy. He's a stuck up trainer with the shiny Vikavolt. He was a welcomed addition though, as his rivalry with Sophocles aided in his development, and the episodes he did appear in tend to be some of the best Sophocles episodes. Now we move on to the Ash Ketchum rivals, starting with... <sighs> How? They really disrespected him in this series. He had so much potential, but unfortunately he only makes one appearance before the league, doesn't get any screen time during the battle royal, gets his win against Ash overturned by his grandfather, and is eliminated by God Rowlet. Although I enjoyed the few battles he had with Ash, he just did not get enough time to shine. Like it says a lot what his Decidueye is a better rival than he was. Now Kiawe, he does count as a rival in my opinion, but I already talked about him. So next is Edgelord Gladion, and he was the complete opposite of how in both personality and execution. The beginning of Sun and Moon lacked direction for Ash. This is until Gladion was introduced. Not only did he and his Lycanroc spark a rivalry for Ash and his then Rockruff, but he also inspired Ash to continue his island challenge. Then the roles are reversed after the Nebi arc, where Gladion is the one inspired to do the island challenge because of Ash. Both trainers had an influence on each other, which only made them stronger and have more respect for each other. The Nebi arc in particular played a key role in their rivalry, as Gladion didn't like that Ash was caring for an Ultra Beast, nor did he like him being involved in his family drama. But it's the love and compassion Ash earns in Alola that ultimately gets through to Gladion and allows him to accept Ash as a true friend and rival. I mean, he did help save his mom after all. And because these two played such a big role in helping each other complete their island challenge, it's only fitting that they face off in the Alola League Finals in an epic doggo fight. This was a solid rivalry. Now you might think that's it for the Sun and Moon rivals, but there's actually one more that needs to be mentioned. The Masked Royal, aka Professor Kakui. That's right, Chad Dad Kakui is in fact a rival thanks to the rivalry of Torcat and Incineroar. Because of this, we were treated to an amazing exhibition battle during the conclusion of the Alola League. And Kakui's identity being revealed makes it all the more better since the man Ash was admiring turned out to be his father figure all along. Talk about an epic father and son bonding time. On to the pacing and character development. First, let's start with Satoshi. After obtaining the Z-Ring in SM2 by way of Tapu Koko, he faced his first grand trial with Hala in SM10. If we take a look at Satoshi's other grand trial wins, you have Lychee in SM36, Kuchinashi in SM77, and Hapu in SM109. If you look at the episodes within the first year and a half of the series, a decent chunk of those are... Do the thing, Zack. Oh god, it won't stop! While Satoshi's trial pacing could have been better, I also felt that there were too many main characters to develop in such a short period of time, and that ended up being the Achilles heel of this series. Some of them either had a gimmick that ended too quickly, like Lily's shyness to Pokemon, or took too long to develop, like Mao's backstory. While the pacing improved by the time the Nebi and Necrozma arc started, there's one thing that sticks out like a sore thumb. Sweden's Poplio evolved twice in a span of 14 episodes without even battling. I believe this was done intentionally due to Mao and Mamane already having fully evolved Pokemon at that point, and the league was right around the corner. There's a lot more I can go into, but I don't want this to end up being an hour-long video. Instead, I'd like to talk about censorship. Ah yes, censorship. Sun and Moon had the most censorship in Western countries since Advanced Generation. I'm not talking about the erasing of Japanese text on the Grand Trials of Z-Moves. I'm talking about things like Meowth dying in SM12 after it looked under Mimikyu's disguise, Wobbuffet's soul escaping in SM52 after Beware hugs the rockets, Ryuki's shurikens getting changed from metal to plastic, and editing out Serena's dominatrix stomps on other humans in Pokemon. Unlike AG, these edits were done by OLM themselves. The most significant piece of censorship was the skipping of SM64, Satoshi and Pissimian, a touchdown of friendship, where Satoshi dressed up as a Pissimian to assist the Melee Melee Pissimian in a football game. However, the face paint looked offensive enough 
For TPC, I'd outright skip this episode. Too bad. It was a great app to watch. I'm going to pass the baton now to Trey to talk about Satoshi's Trials. It's battle time. Other than that one Ryuki battle, Sun and Moon is the first series where Ash isn't going for gym badges. Instead, he takes on the Alola Trials. And can I say, these battles definitely hold up in terms of animation, great story, and awesome action. The first two trials against Totem Gumshoes and Hala prove to us that this version of Ash was not reset, as he came up with some awesome strategies and won both of these battles on his first go. Next we have Akala, which holds many fans favorite grand trial, including myself, the Olivia battle. I love that Pikachu took a backseat this island to let Lynn, Rowlet, and Rockruff shine against Totem Laurentis and Olivia. Ash was put at a disadvantage with Rockruff accidentally knocking out Rowlet, but still managed to pull through for the victory. Ula Ula shot the most in terms of Ash's character development. After being defeated by Nanu, Ash set a goal to work on Like Rock's Berserk mode and to prove Nanu wrong. Pikachu was also able to shine in the trials again in the epic Pikachu vs Mimikyu showdown. Nanu made the rematch extremely tough for Ash being a 3v1 and taunted Ash throughout the battle to the point that Like Rock had to snap some sense back into him so that they could finish the fight. With Hobble's trial being many fans least favorite battle, it makes sense as to why Ash used Pikachu for this fight considering that he always used Pikachu for this final gym battle. Many say Ash pulled a Pewter City sprinkler move, but I think this time it was a bit more reasonable since he was using his surroundings to his advantage and saltwater conducts electricity making more sense as to how much Dale was affected than just regular water. And now I'm going to pass over to Ben to talk about the other trials in the series. Thanks bro. Also on the topic of water, Wishy Washy was one of the first non-Ash trials. Which, although it honestly isn't anything amazing in terms of battle choreography, it did provide Lana her first major step of development. In fact, all the other trials I'll be discussing here are used to develop a character in some kind of fashion, instead of trying to be all flashy like the main Ash trials, which I think was a nice change of pace to see at time to time. For example, we had Gladion and Lily team up against Kamato, which was meant to display their teamwork with their different quirks, Sanshru, which actually teamed up with Lily to defeat a wild Pokemon to help her understand battles more, and Trevenant, who gifted Ash the Fire UMC for helping him save some Pokemon. The only remaining trial that seems to focus on the best of both worlds is Tapu Fini, where Kyori was tasked with flying all the way from Pony Island to Rakala to gift it a scale in return for releasing Ash and his Pokemon. Kyori displaying love for his friends, where we get a surprisingly impressive battle between Kyori and Tapu Lele. But yeah, overall, as you should hopefully see from me and Trey, the trials were a fun new addition to the anime, whilst it developed characters in quite splendid ways. Pew pew! Get in the bag. That was cringe. The Nebby arc is what many believe to be the turning point of the Sun and Moon anime, as it's the beginning of the major story arcs in the series. Here is where we get introduced to Professor Burnett, Wick, Faba, and the Ape President herself, Lusamine. The series made many changes to the story during this arc, then the games, which I love them for doing so, so much. For starters, Kaku and Burnett have not yet been married. Burnett was a great addition to the cast and really livened up the house. Also, my boy Kakui with the smooth proposal, my man. Yeah. Damn, I'm a smooth dude. And remember the crazy psychopathic loose meme that froze Pokemon for her own pleasures? Yeah, screw that, because anime loose meme is the best change that the series ever thought of. For starters, Lucimim actually cares about both of her children here. And yes, while there were many changes to her character, this doesn't change the fact that there are many dysfunctional things about their family. Lucimim is always too busy with work to spend time with Lily and Gladion and never considers their feelings when making decisions. Literally, the only reason she's showing attention to Lily now is because her friend Ash was chosen to raise a legendary Ultra Beast, Nebby. Which, by the way, let's talk about him for a bit. As a cosmog, Nebby was the definition of a baby, as he was always curious, loved candy, and always had fun. Things changed, however, upon evolving. Faba seems to play the antagonist in every variant, but here he was definitely the most threatening, putting all of Lily's memories on the line, as well as being the reason that Lucimim entered her mother beast form. My gosh, was that a twist! With how different Lucimim's character was, I did not expect to see her ever reach this form in the anime. We got to see a different side of Lily and Gladion in this arc showing that as dysfunctional their family was, they all still loved and cared for each other deeply. Once Nebby finally becomes the great Sun Legendary Sogaleo, the rest of the arc takes place in Nihilego's world, and everyone splits into different groups in order to battle against Lucimim's Pokemon. The only issue about this, however, is that other than Ash, Gladion, and Kiawe, everyone else was kinda weak, literally having to rely on Ash's other Pokemon to come to their rescue, 
But besides that, this finale was a great way of reuniting the Aether family with Lily expressing her held in emotions to free her mother from the Lego with the help of the Pikachu Z. This arc conclusion was also great in setting up many more plots in the series and brought together both Lily and Ash's Alola family. Now I'll pass it on to my bro TSS to tackle one of those set up plots. Ultra Roger! So, the Ultra Guardians are a squadron that were formed by Lusamine to help protect the Lola from Ultra Beasts that are coming out of random Ultra Wormholes. Satoshi and his classmates would descend to a secret underground area underneath the school while having a transformation sequence that wouldn't be out of place in a Super Sentai series. All it needs is a theme song from Psychic Lover to complete the aesthetic. The Ultra Guardians then receive a briefing from Lusamine, Wick, and Professor Burnett about the Ultra Beasts they'll be facing. Then they all take off out of their base on their ride Pokemon in a Thunderbirds-like montage. Interestingly enough, the Alolan Executor parting ways is a direct homage to Thunderbird 2's launch sequence. Although the concept of the Ultra Guardians seemed like a great idea on paper, Satoshi and his classmates taking on Ultra Beasts, the execution, however, was very underwhelming. To give a brief summary of most of the Ultra Guardians episodes, Buzzwall wanted to have its own flex off a thon, Celesteela wanted to blast off and set ablaze to everything that was surrounding it. We had Michael Jackson versus a short-circuited Christmas tree, where those two Ultra Beasts are outsparking each other while Satoshi becomes handsome. Honey, I Shrunk the Alola Kids, where Faba accidentally turns Satoshi and Lily small and Pikachu sneezes on them. Stakataka gets ticked off when Viren's gold statue is placed on top of it. An Alolan Golem who has a facial hair contest with a Matang while the hiker triplets look on. Formosa, who likes stealing Z crystals while Meowth has a hard on. And Kartana who like to slice random objects while sounding like a bodily waste product. Man, some of these missions were just all over the place. There is a solid two-parter relating to Guzzlard though. However, this one wasn't even part of the Ultra Guardians. Very ironic. There is one last mission, however, that has its own entire arc, which I'll be passing over to Ben to talk about. Thanks, TSS. Yes, we are of course referencing the Necrozma Rock. Which, I actually specifically asked Zack if I could speak about this, as I do love my Sun and Moon themes. Which this arc is probably the best arc outside of the Alola League to demonstrate those themes. Aight, so before I get into why I love this arc, the gist of the Necrozma arc is that Necrozma lost its true form saving Poipo's world, and it wakes up angry one day looking for light to receive its true form once again. Which the Ultra Guardians and Nippy who returns alongside the Lunana are tasked with battling it so it doesn't cause any damage. Eventually, however, they learn the truth once going to Poipo's world, in which they then decide to get everybody in the Lola to share their sea power to Necrozma to help it regain its true form, which successfully works. This all being held on a day called the Minolo Festival as well, where all of the Lola comes together anyway to pray to the Light Trail who was said to create a Lola. Alright, so in the long run, I will admit, this doesn't really sound as exciting as the Nebi arc or any other anime adaptation arc for that matter. But I would say that's pretty much the point though. What the writers wanted to do here is display all of the Alola themes in one big arc. A.K.A. Friendship, Family, Care, Sharing and Receiving. And honestly, all of us here find that so beautiful. Manolo, the name of the festival, even means you and I are living here together. With what Sun and Moon wants to be, this Necrozma arc is a perfect arc for the series. And even if most of the arc is exposition, we did still receive some awesome action scenes here and there anyway. Such as the entirety of episode 88 where they battle Necrozma, and episode 89 where Kukri battled for Team Rocket admin. Yeah, Team Rocket are also in this arc. Because apparently Giovanni somehow knows about Necrozma from being friends with Nanu in the past. Which, it never gets explained how they met, which is unfortunate. And honestly, Team Rocket could have been done a little bit better overall too. To wrap up this section of the Necrozma arc though, this arc wasn't just dedicated to Necrozma, but also Poipo as well. It finding its way back home after it had been sent to Alola to have someone restore light back to its world. Meaning... Ash had to release it as his true family was right here. Which, although this was a very depressing scene, our one other con for this arc would be that its release also felt a bit rushed for no good reason. Like literally, Lucemin says the wormhole is closing so we need to leave quick, but like, maybe can make wormholes, so <laughs> yeah. But you know what, nevertheless, even with the negatives there, 
Overall, this arc was still fantastic for the each of us, and definitely a unique way to adapt the Ultra Sun Ultra Moon story. And now that brings us to the biggest and most important arc in the series, the Alola League. Man, where do I begin with this? Now when the series first started and we saw that Ash was gonna go to school, the idea that the anime would adapt the Alola League seemed extremely unlikely, but boy was that wrong. Although the series lacked direction in the first season, once the League was finally mentioned in episode 43, it would then begin to change Sun and Moon for the better. Now obviously, what made this League stand out is the fact that it finally gives us the Ash Ketchum Pokemon League win we've all been waiting for. That alone would've been it honestly. But not only did we get that, but we also got this gargantuan 17 episode League arc that developed all of our major characters. One of the gripes of this League is the fact that anyone can enter, but that's the reason the League turned out so good. The goal of this league wasn't only about crowning Alola's first champion, but it was also meant to help all the participating trainers and Pokemon grow together. This is so in line with Alola's themes. Because of that, this league wasn't just about Ash, but it was about his amazing friends we've gotten to know within the series. His rivals, his enemies, everyone in Alola was involved. Because of this, for the first time, we got to see every single league battle, and even got amazing moments like Mallow mastering her Z-move, Lily showing off her progress as a trainer, a goofy Jesse and James battle, Sophocles giving it his all against Kiawe, Kiawe sparking a new rivalry with Gladion, and then there's your boy Guzma with Team Skull. His goal is to end the league, so he's literally the antithesis of everything Alola stands for. This made the league so much more interesting, as now Ash is fighting to protect the values he's learned to love. Going back to Ash though, he's actually the one that gets the most development out of anyone else here. Not only does he defeat all of his rivals here, but his team develops throughout the entire league to finish off as one of his best and strongest. Then once it's all said and done, we wrap things up with an epic 4 part battle against Professor Kakui, Ash's Alolan father figure. Oh yeah, and he also beats the legendary Tapu Koko as well. I could not think of a better way to end things off. Our boy straight up proves that he's the strongest trainer in Alola, a true Chad champion. And so, with the Alola League out of the way, it's time to talk about the ending of the series, which definitely was an emotional one, while displaying all the lessons our characters have learned and how they can develop next in a wondrous way. So, after Ash had become the Alola champion, he was stuck figuring out what to work towards next. However, eventually after Olivia talks about how the world can broaden your view on life, Ash agrees with this due to how he came to love and appreciate Alola's surroundings, then deciding that he wants to keep exploring the world to admire the rest of its beauty, while then hopefully finding the next answer to reach his Pokemon Master goal. Which honestly, is probably my favourite way they've ever continued Ash's character, not only because it displays how Alola has beautifully changed how he appreciates life, but also because in past services, Ash would usually find out about a brand new region after the League with its own set of gyms. And then, boom, he's gone right to it. It was starting to get repetitive and boring, but this time, he's going anywhere he wants, looking for an answer himself this time around. Which is such a nice change of pace, and of course fits well for Journeys as a series where Ash and Go visit every region. Ash's goodbye to his Alola family after this revelation was extremely emotional, which does add points to this ending as well. As for Team Rocket, as usual they get called back by HQ to show their progress, but honestly there's no other way they could really write Team Rocket out of a region, so I'm okay with this. However, this is the first time since a decade they ended up releasing their Pokemon, simply because much like Ash's Pokemon, Alola is their home, they don't want to take that away from them. They've come so far. Have I goodbye seen? Man, I could feel a tear once to fall as Beware hug them goodbye softly. It knowing Team Rocket have developed in a magical way as well since staying with it. But then Johnny's had to f it up. Finally for Ash's companions, as I said, Lily decides to go search for her father, which as a Lily stand for goodbye seen her incredibly, Kyori decides to become a Kahuna, which is excellent progression, Sophocles decides to visit Moss Deep City for a space camp, I just wish we got to see something like that on screen though, Lana decides to go search for Manaphy with her father, which is okay as it's summer vacation I guess, but like, Mano is now left all alone at her restaurant, even Shaman ditched her, which I kinda don't like this, I mean it didn't make it more sad I will admit that, and everyone does come back eventually, but still, <laughs> I feel like she was done a bit dirty here. 
And that wraps up all the major elements of the Sun and Moon anime. Time for the final verdict. And after watching every single episode, I can confidently say that in my opinion, Sun and Moon is a great series. Now it's funny, cause I actually really hated Sun and Moon back in the day. Coming fresh off of X, Y, and Z, I was turned off by the art style and comedy, and I feel like a lot of us were the same way. But boy am I glad I gave it a chance. Now sure, it is a huge departure from what we're used to when it comes to a Pokemon series, but that doesn't mean it was bad. After 20 years of the same formula, they wanted to shake things up to stay fresh, and you know what? I'm kinda glad they did. Although it's not what I personally look for in a Pokemon series, I actually walked away absolutely loving Sun and Moon. This kinda relates back to what I said in the black and white review, about enjoying things for what they are instead of judging them for what they aren't. If we stop comparing it to XY so much, or any other series for that matter, you'll be able to enjoy all the wonderful things this series has to offer. Like Ben, I've really come to love all the themes of Alola that stay present all throughout the series, like family and friendship. It's so damn wholesome. It's themes that have always been a constant for the Pokemon franchise, but are the most prominent and pivotal to this series. My absolute favorite element thanks to this series is Ash's Alolan family. Not only was Ash living with Professor Kakui, but we also get Kakui proposing to Burnett, getting married to Burnett, and giving Ash an Alolan mom. I love you, Delia, but damn is Burnett an awesome mother figure. We also see Ash letting his Pokemon be out of their Pokeballs more often and just letting them chill around the house like they're pets, cause they're part of the family too. I love this. These are elements that would have been lost if Sun and Moon was a travel series like XY. We wouldn't build such strong relationships with these people and Pokemon, and we wouldn't be nearly as invested in all of the characters as well. And of course, this is the series where Ash finally won a league, but I guarantee you that it wouldn't be as satisfying without Alola's themes. So in conclusion, although Sun and Moon wasn't what I was expecting from a Pokemon series, nor is it my favorite, it's definitely the one I've had the most fun with. And I don't know about you, but that sounds like a pretty great series to me. Thanks everyone for watching my review of the Sun and Moon anime. Huge thanks to Trey, TSS, and Ben for joining me. And as always, shout out to Spire and Silverstorm for their awesome music. Check them all out if you haven't already. Last but not least, make sure to live your life to the fullest and have yourself a damn good one.